Well, great. Well, thank you everybody for attending this presentation today. We will go ahead and in keeping on time to get started with the session on integrity, taking a new approach to managing your sanctions, exclusions, and other uh, oversight processes. Uh, we really appreciate everybody joining this session. And without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Tom Leahy. I head up sales and business development with SureShield. And uh, I've been in the compliance, security, risk management world for about 30 some odd years now. And I have joining me our CTO, Chandi Billigu, who will talk a little bit about the product offerings we have. Uh, and uh, we will uh, continue to go ahead and continue the session. Uh, for those of you who are joining, just to let you know that a recording of the webinar will be provided to you, as well as the content of this presentation. So again, we appreciate you taking the time uh, to join the session. We'll talk a little bit, first of all, about OIG oversight and what they're tasked to do. Um, what's happening with the ramped up enforcement around that, as we know, COVID did play, take a, a, play a role in reducing a little bit of the strict enforcement, but that is now kind of coming back. So we'll talk a little bit about the OIG and the OCR and what their responsibilities are, what impact that has in terms of compliance requirements that you may have as a healthcare institution. We'll also briefly talk about a new act that many folks are really not aware uh, has been enacted, but down very uh, soon down the road could come with some very significant compliance and fine issues for actually anybody that does business with the federal government. But again, maybe even more so it can be impacting healthcare because of the means in which they deliver services and the types of technologies they use. Uh, we'll talk about the current challenges that go to managing your sanctions, exclusions, um, and oversight processes, and then how you can leverage technology provided by companies like us at SureShield. We're going to show you some tools that can actually help you, I would say, almost completely automate that process. So as many of you know, if any of you that are in the compliance and risk management side of things, you know, the, the healthcare organizations uh, have a number of different compliance requirements that come under the health and human services area. You have the Office of Inspector General, and that particular office requires that, you know, organizations are, work with vendors who aren't sanctioned or excluding from working with federal or state programs. So as you know, if you are a healthcare institution, any provider, any vendor, any employee that you have is supposed to be monitored and evaluated at, at higher and on a regular basis to make sure they are not showing up on any of these exclusion lists. And there are a lot of them. So it's not an easy process to try to manage and, and look over those. And then of course, you also have the Office for Civil Rights, the OCR, they oversee HIPAA compliance and they require, of course, that any entity working with PHI, that you have proper security and risk assessment programs in place, not only to evaluate your own system, but to make sure that any business associate or someone else who's handling third-party data is following those requirements as well. And as many know in the past, you know, now it's quite some time ago, maybe 10 years ago, those business associate agreements essentially reduce liability or relieve liability of a covered entity for um, infractions of a business associate if they were to have had issues with breach data. In 2015, that pretty much significantly changed. Uh, meaning that they came back with rules that said it's not as, as much, it's not as simple as having a business associate agreement in place. It's demonstrating that you took proper actions as a covered entity 
to make sure that your BAs were doing the right things to protect data. And if you don't have that paper trail and you don't have that oversight backup, you are just as liable as that institution. So you kind of have a, a double whammy of, of different oversight uh, entities. And I'll get into uh, shortly another one that is coming your way, another oversight uh, that relates to uh, individuals or vendors that you can't be working with. Um, of course, COVID had a big impact in 2020 on really in, in two ways. One, the OIG kind of let up or reduced enforcement a little bit because they knew of the significant issues that the healthcare ecosystem was dealing with and trying to uh, deal with this pandemic crisis, which really today still exists. However, that also opened up the opportunities for bad players and hackers and, and a number of other providers and all who had bad intentions to uh, increase their uh, focus on trying to create havoc and to steal data and to create a lot of problems. So while that enforcement kind of turned back a little, the issues of fraud and abuse and the likes significantly increased. So the long story short on that is that those efforts to enforce this, to enforce, you know, uh, compliance with these processes has, uh, and has begun to ramp up pretty significantly. And as you know, if you are in a situation where you are working with a provider that may have been sanctioned, the costs of not just the penalties, but are, are, are it's extremely significant. Last year alone, there were over 1,400 sanctions and exclusion actions uh, in the last year. And that number will continue to go up. Uh, overall, there was a over $6 billion in investigative and audit receivables collected by the OIG. So they are uh, coming back to making sure that that doesn't take place. And I just wanted to point out, you know, what they expect or what the expectation is for those of you uh, who are in the ha having to handle the exclusions and sanction uh, process. So again, there are databases, providers, employees, uh, uh, vendors, that if they have done anything to be put on these, what they call exclusion or sanction lists, basically an exclusion or sanction is where they have been caught in an act of doing something that the OIG considers uh, criminal, fraudulent, a number of other things. And then if that is the case, they are put on lists and they're basically telling providers or covered entities that are working with these, or with these groups that are working with those types of, not working with those folks, but with their ecosystem, they're telling them, you are not allowed to employ or to have contracts or with any of the, uh, these individuals that are on these lists. Now that includes four federal databases and over 39 states that have their own sanctions and exclusion list. The expectation, which is um, still quite difficult that the OIG has put out there is we expect you to be checking this and then checking your ecosystem at least monthly. Now, consider uh, an entity, a hospital, a large physician practice, uh, a skilled nursing facility. If you were to add up the numbers of employees and vendors and providers that you have in there, they run from the hundreds to thousands. And the ability to actually do monitoring of those individuals and to be checking on the, those databases against those individuals is virtually impossible without good tools, right? And these are just some, I would say, uh, examples of different entities that got hit with fines and settlements with the OIG because they were working with excluded or sanctioned individuals. And these numbers can increase and add up quite significantly. 
I'm just going to touch briefly uh, as well on another act that just came out, which is the McCain Act. And we'll get to, again, this is just adding more to the extreme difficulty of keeping oversight of all those in your ecosystem. So the McCain Act was introduced in August of 2018. And the primary reason uh, around it uh, was you know, the issues of a tremendous amount of espionage and stealing of national security information. As we know, we see, we see news every day about uh, Russian hacking and Iranian hacking. This was primarily directed and is directed right now at uh, Chinese nationals or Chinese um, companies underneath the China, you know, under the Chinese government. And really they passed an act that, that basically said, nobody that works with anything that has to do with a federal contract, whether it's a minor, tiny little piece part of your business, or it's a major part of your business, you are forbidden from using technology from, from listed companies. And the, right now those companies are all primarily Chinese companies. You can be certain that that is going to get uh, increased or it's going to be added to not only with Chinese companies, and actually I just read something where the president uh, just indicated a ban on another uh, Chinese national company. But this will get extended to anyone that are considered hostile nations towards us. And so you as a provider are expected to make sure that you do not have any of these types of equipment or services in your environment. If you, if you are to do so, um, you're subject to penalties, you are right now. It's the what I would call a self a, a testament process. That self attestment could come with issues around false claims. If you've made a claim that you're that you are in compliance and it's found that you're not. So the first provision of of this eight eight nine provision of the of the McCain Act was basically telling first of all the government couldn't use any of these and couldn't contract with any of these companies. And then it was extended uh, a couple of years ago, or actually right in the midst of COVID, um, they extended it to the 889B provision, which indicates that the government can't contract with any entity that uses telecommunication or services as a substantial or essential component of any system, right? And this is regardless of whether that is in, in performance of a federal contract. So let me try to give a little example. As, let's assume the, uh, you're providing, uh, I would say landscaping services. And in the, in the course of providing those, you're not, you are not doing anything but bringing your lawnmowers and the likes onto that property that's, the, it, let's just, it's contracted with the federal government. If you indeed had any of this technology that was being used for any other purposes, so you had a personal computer that had one of these banned Chinese companies uh, technology on it, you're forbidden from using that. So think of it from particularly from areas of uh, healthcare, the different types of communication equipment that you have. There was an explosion in video and tele uh, health services. You have smart uh, systems that are being used, the monitoring systems that you have in your environment, uh, the medical record systems you have, the surveillance systems you have. All of these have the potential to have that technology or have components of that technology. And if so, you're not supposed to have it, and you're supposed to get rid of it. And if, now think of trying adding that on top of all the employees and vendors that you're working with, it's not just the companies, but it's the technology that those companies provide. So trying to manage this process and the compliance challenges of this are super, super difficult and challenging. And really, uh, how, is it, how are folks going about it right now? A lot of institutions are doing it in a uh, manual process. So they may be using an Excel spreadsheet that has the names of the 
uh, vendors, the names of the employees in their environment. And then on a periodic basis, they're going and either directly checking uh, against these different databases, or they may be using, there are companies out there that will do those checks for you. So you load up a list of individuals and you give it to those companies and they go and check and they come back and they tell you yay or nay, whether everything is good or whether you have a problem. Uh, a lot of this is done, as we said, manually. And think of this, you have to check four different, if, if you're an entity that works in multi-states, you not only have to check the federal databases, but you also have to be checking the state exclusion databases as well. So it is monumental work. And quite honestly, it's, it's, it's impossible to do without good tools or technology to assist in this process. They're really, is no good systems that will do this on a regular and continuous basis for you. And we're gonna to talk to you a little bit about how SureShield can help you in that process. But in many ways in which organizations and compliance uh, organizations are going about this is kind of uh, in a couple of different ways. They may be doing periodic spot checks. Well, that's great and it's good to be doing those checks but you could have a provider that you check today and tomorrow they could end up on that list. And if you don't know that, or you haven't checked them again, you have, a, you have that latency period where that person could be person or company or entity could be in your environment, putting you at extreme risk for fines. And as we said, these entities now are picking up the pace to enforce these activities. So at a minimum, having tools that can help you do this on a regular basis helps provide you, I would call it super insurance and protection insurance to make sure you don't run into those places. Um, think of adding to that, having to check vendors for 889B compliance. It's the same issue. You're either having to go out on a regular basis and collect all the vendors and all the technology that you have in your company and trying to do a match against those that you know you can't work with. And again, new technologies are added all the time into an ecosystem. So how do you regularly uh, check that? It's a, it's a very significant challenge. And so a lot of organizations go about by trying to do maybe what they consider to be, I'm going to manage against what might, might be my higher risk potential people or vendors, knowing that I can't manage against all of them. So you have to kind of pick your poison about what you're gonna check and then hope that there's nothing that comes to follow you bad for those that you didn't. So it's really impossible to monitor all on a regular basis. It is if you don't have good tools in place. And it's time consuming and, and, you know, and risky for providers. So how can SureShield and how can we help change that game? Uh, we have a technology called Integrity Shield. It's under the umbrella of the product offerings that we provide that really adds a 24 by seven oversight process for you where we automate that whole process. So think of it, we basically, depending upon what it is that you want us to manage, we can take all of your vendors, all your employees, and we can match them up. And we've, what we've done is we have scraped all these different databases. So we have a, a tool that actually nightly goes into each and every one of these federal databases, as well as this banned vendor database for uh, related to the Chinese technology. And we look at that on a, on a daily basis. We compare that and we match that up against the, your ecosystem. So your providers, your employees, your vendors. And we can give you real time alerts and real-time information as to exactly where an issue or a problem may be. And that's done on a nightly basis. So it really helps, it, it becomes an almost an automated 
uh, system, an extra person that's doing this for you, think about it on a daily basis. And what it's doing is managing by exception as well. If you know that you're okay, right? You don't wanna be alerted about a vendor or an employee who isn't an issue to worry about. You wanna be notified if there's something that's an exception that you need to take action on. And so it, it allows us to actually manage that entire, and you to manage that entire ecosystem of yours really in a very simple and uh, easy process. And what does that do for you? Of course, it significantly lowers your risk profile. It helps protect you from working with vendors. And we have many examples of providers that we've worked with by having the checks done have helped them avoid a very significant potential penalty or issue with that. And to be able to take action very quickly if something is identified. As we mentioned on the exclusions and sanctions side, if you, were, if you have a provider that was identified, they can go back and look at every single claim associated with that provider and, and establish a fine. And right now those fines run about $16,000 a claim. So you can just imagine if even someone had done 10, 20, 30, what those costs are in terms of penalties. And we can break that down to make that a, you know, a comprehensive solution that can be looked at multiple staff for anything that they may be, need to do. Because on the compliance side, you may have one group that just looks at sanctions and exclusions, but oftentimes it could be broken up. The HR could be doing employees. The medical staff could be doing medical staff. Uh, your procurement may be doing vendors. And so bringing that all together in one uh, methodology is quite difficult. And again, this is something you can do by managing this centrally, but even distributing this work. And as we mentioned, you get automatically alerted if there are uh, exceptions to what is in that particular database. So again, a couple of the key features, and we'll actually give you a quick uh, product overview and also give you kind of what I would call a schematic of how this all works. But key features of Integrity Shield, of course, it's a real-time automated continuous monitoring tool across multiple databases, whether those are the exclusion database, the vendor database, and we're adding and going to be adding more to this. It's super simple to deploy. We can actually turn it on and have you up and running with it in less than 30 days, probably uh, less than two weeks. It basically just requires some work on getting information on your ecosystem. And then once that's in there, it's automatically running. And you can use it to run, first of all, on anyone you're evaluating bringing in, which you should be doing. And then once they're in, if they've been, if they're not of concern, it will run that continuously so that you will never have to worry about doing your own checks on that again. And as I said, it covers the entire ecosystem and then it will provide you with very good insights and reports and alerts to help you manage this process. And again, as we know, given what's taken place with the pandemic over the last uh, two years, resources for compliance monitoring for risk management have been stretched. They're, they're not putting a lot of uh, right now money into those types of systems, given the nature of the, the chaos and the crisis we've been dealing with. So this is a very, very simple deploy and it's actually a super economical uh, tool to help you with. So I won't spend a lot of time on on this schematic, but basically, as we mentioned, how this works is you have, we have all those sources of the different databases, whether it's the OFAC, whether it's a SAM, the LEIE, whether it's a statewide or state related in, uh, exclusions, you know, practitioner credentialing database, the banned Chinese entity database. We have access to all of those. We import 
the information on your ecosystem, either by pulling it from your database or pulling spreadsheets in that may already have that. And then we go ahead and consolidate that and we do daily checks against that, that then are provided to you so that you can look at your whole ecosystem and then getting a dashboard to let you know and alerts to let you know where you may need to take action. And I'm going to show that to you briefly in a product demo. Just as a, uh, a sense, as we said, on, on the sanctions and exclusion side, I think it's actually been ex expanded to 39 states now. But these are all the different databases, the states and the federal databases that have to be checked and should be checked monthly. I can guarantee you, if you're not using a tool like ours, there's nobody, hardly anybody that's doing monthly. If they are, hats off to them. If they're able to check every single provider in their entities, there's probably plenty that do handfuls of them at a time, but not doing them on a continuous basis. So, and if you're an entity that works in multiple states, you need to be checking those as you know, you need to be checking the different state based databases as well. It's not easy to do. So I'm going to give you a, a quick view into the Integrity Shield product and kind of how it works and how simple it is to work with and the, what I would call the dashboard nature of this. So Chandi, if you are on with me or Randy, um, can you just validate that you're seeing my screen? Yes. Okay, great. So where I'm, what I'm in is in a customer demo site. And this is basically what I would call our sanctions and exclusions uh, view. So for those that are using it for monitoring their employees, their entities, and their individuals in their environment. So in this example, you can see that I have, uh, from a dashboard perspective, 193 records or 193 different entities that I am looking at. Those are, and you can see how it's broken up into employees, entities, and individuals. To actually do an initial check, there's a couple of different ways. Once you have a lot of your current information in here, when you're looking at bringing on a new provider, it's as simple as just saying, add a new record indicating what that, you know, are, is this a contracted provider? Is it a prospective provider? I can indicate what type of provider that is. I type in the name of the organization and then I simply click and it will run an automatic check against this uh, right away. So if in the beginning, we'll just tell you right away whether you have any kind of consideration or issue with that particular group. And what it will report on is if indeed you have an issue, what that issue is and where. So in, you can see in this particular case, we have 193 records and there are 11 in this case, and hopefully that would not be the case of you that have actually been excluded. One other thing to note, and this is super helpful when you're implementing the system, it, is the fact that it will actually do what I would call retroactive um, checks. So it will, once it's looking at the data, it will also go back and look at history of individuals that may have been on the list. You, you can come off, right? You can serve your time basically and be removed from those lists. A lot of folks would like to know whether they're working with someone that had previously been on these. So our system not only does a, a, current, a current check, but it also can do historical checks so you can see if you had someone that was on in the past. And that's this area of history. But if I were to just click into these, it's bringing up the names of those. We, in all cases, we have ways in which you can we call filter the data. So if I just wanted to look at those that were my business associates or my employees, or my, my individual vendors or my vendors. I can segment on those. I can look at those that are sanctioned. And then if I were to go into this and clicked on this, I can actually take a look and it will tell me uh, this particular entity is on. And if I were to go into it deeper, it will tell me what lists and they ended up on. What were the exclusion types? And they're different depending upon the database. So in this case, this particular entity was on the LEIE, 
the SAM and that it was also on an Ohio exclusion list. And if I were to drill in further, I can get a lot more information on that. You can also take actions on those. So sometimes it's, it's, there are instances where there are false positive matches. And so you always have the ability to take more action and reach out and say, hey, I want to request some information for you. You're coming up on this list and I want you to validate, you know, uh, whether this is misinformation and give me supporting documentation as to why that is. So again, a very easy way to communicate within the ecosystem and also to take the fast actions to get them out of a relationship if indeed they are, could be detrimental to your organization. And then within here, there are a lot of different reports that can be run on, on that information as well. So if you were to come in here, you have a variety of different reports that looks you look at exclusion status, history, uh, all the likes on there. Now, similarly, our 889B tool for monitoring vendors that are on the band on the band uh, list as it relates to Chinese technology companies, it works pretty much the same way. The one thing that we can do is actually add an additional utility on here that makes that process uh, a little bit more, uh, even more easy to manage by running a small utility that can identify, rather than just identifying the vendors, we can run a utility that will identify all the devices in your system, because remember, this is banned technology associated with those vendors. So our, we do what we would call a discovery scan of the assets in your environment. And then we can match those up by what they call MAC addresses. Think of it as a, a uh, an SSN number almost for that device that will tell you who the manufacturer is, who the company is that owns them. So we can do immediate identifications as to whether you have any of those vendors uh, in your ecosystem and helping you do the, do the necessary to take proper action. Right now, I believe there's more than close to 230 that are on this list. If I were to click into here, it will show me that grouping. So there are six related national companies and underneath them, they have subsidiaries. So this is showing me all of those that are on that particular uh, list. And again, when I've run that through my environment, <clears throat> it will show me both at my level and also at my supply chain. So you can push this out to people in your supply chain and ask them to do the same for you to run checks and make sure that they don't have anyone that's in those environments as well. So if I were to look in this and I'm looking at my network environment, it's telling me here's one of those that was a matched up uh, entity, who the vendor is, and then I can actually go identify this particular piece of technology and work to have it getting pulled out of my environment. So the minute I've at any time run this, it's going to give me that data. And it automates this whole process, as we said, on a 24 by seven basis. So those are the components of the Integrity Shield products. And a new way to, as we said, to actually go about managing this in a more simple and a more complete uh, manner. And as I said, we have a number of entities that work with us because it really gives them complete peace of mind as to managing this whole process. They're able to manage their entire ecosystem with this. And, uh, you know, they have this, as we said, this uh, exception based process so that they're only needing to react to those areas that they know they need to. So, as we talked, the, as we said, the OCR is going to continue to ramp up. And so will the OIG, it's enforcement of these requirements. If you are responsible for maintaining and doing this, you know, it, it's coming at you and will start to come at you. You've got a new McCain Act 
requirements, uh, compliance requirement. The COVID resources are strapped. We know that, so we've seen that, but the increases in fraud continue to proliferate. So having tools that can help mitigate that risk while lowering your costs, you know, are, are things that you as someone that has a responsibility of this should be considering. Um, so with that, we'll actually, I'm gonna launch a quick poll. We are going, we are offering this to folks that may be interested in testing this out. All of our products can be tested under a trial basis for no cost. And so for those of us, you who are joining this presentation, if you're interested, in uh, testing out the solution, please indicate yes or no, and we'll be following, or maybe later, and we'll be following up with you to get in contact if you have uh, interest in testing. And I see that we have a few folks that are on the presentation that would like to do so. Um, but why don't we go ahead at this point? If you want to go into your Q and A, you will see. The, in the Zoom presentation, there's an area to go ask your questions. And uh, why don't we go ahead and open this up to any questions that folks may have. And I will keep the poll open uh, for those who are uh, on the presentation until the end, uh, should you decide that you want to um, test the solution out for yourself. So I see we had a couple of questions that were asked. Uh, and I'm assuming uh, Randy and Shani that everybody could see the, the answers to those questions. Yes. Okay. I see another uh, question about, some folks have asked about pricing. Um, these, the nice thing with these is that they're just basically an annual subscription price. There's no cost, what I say, per check. So a lot of companies that are doing those checks will charge you based upon the number of checks that they are doing. Um, in our case, we look at your ecosystem and the size of that ecosystem, and we have a one-time, what I would call, annual subscription for doing this. And keeping in mind, it's doing it all the time, 24 by seven for you. So extremely economical and really, uh, you know, it helps you leverage technology to do work that uh, humans may be doing. Sorry, we've got someone that's still on. Other questions? Oh, uh, and Chandi, if you're on with us, they're asking how are we checking? Uh, one folk says they understand how we check against the LEIE and those types of databases, but how are we updating this banned uh, entity list related to the 889B? Yeah, so that's actually not easy to obtain. While the government just lists the main companies, which are five or six in number, all these people try to circumvent the ban by creating subsidiaries across the world. So we need to track that. And the way we do that is to basically study their annual reports and other news sources to basically identify them and then add to the list. So it's a continuous process. I'm not seeing any other questions right now. So again, I've got the poll open. I see that there's a few folks on the on the call that would like to have um, the trial. So post this, you will you will be receiving, like we mentioned, a copy of the content as well as a copy uh, or a, a link to the recording. And all of you, for those who are interested in trialing, you should receive a message asking for some dates and times at work to get that set up for you. Uh, for those of you who have said maybe later or no, we will, um, you'll be receiving a, a message that will give you information directed to this and we will continue to keep you informed 
about uh, you know offerings and things we do here at SureShield. So I want to thank you all for your time today. And with that, we will go ahead and get ready to conclude the session. I'll leave it open for just another minute for any other questions. It looks like we have one more that came in. Uh, Chandi, there's a question about links for compliance in Illinois. I'm assuming they are on the, um, Illinois is on, do they have a state database ban list? If they do, then the answer would be yes. Actually, yeah, some states have multiple pages with their list and some have none. So it takes some effort to find them all. But uh, yeah, we have a list of all the states that today, today put out the list and we crawl them to get the updates. Great. All right, well, with that, we will go ahead and conclude the, the session. Thank you all for joining. And we look forward to the opportunity to work with you here uh, in the near future. And we'll be in touch with those who, uh, all of you, but for those of you in particular that have indicated an interest in 